Praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Faith, Hope, and Love Ministries and Retreat Services International Weekly Broadcast with Pastor William Whitfield, our senior pastor. Today's word is concerning reconciliation in Hebrews, the second chapter. Let us now praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Whitfield thanking you for tuning in to this broadcast on this Sunday, September 15, 2013. Today, we're going to be talking about reconciliation or true reconciliation. And I'm going to call your attention to Hebrews, the second chapter, where we're going to be reading a couple of verses there. Uh, And we have multiple passages of scripture that we will be going through throughout the course of this lesson on today. And as always, I ask that you please have your Bibles ready so that you can go into the Word of the Lord with us and read right along with us. The version that I typically use is the King James Version, but there are times that I make reference uh, to the NIV, the New International Version, as well as other versions. But today we're going to be looking primarily in the King James Version of the Scripture. Now let's go into prayer. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for this day. We thank you for your people. We thank you that this is the day that you have made. We shall be grateful and rejoice in it. So God, as we go into your word, send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Cover all of us, your people, regardless of where we are in the world, with your blood and with your anointing. And give us ears to hear and eyes to see what Jesus is saying unto us today through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, we're going to be talking about true reconciliation. Uh, the other day I was driving home uh, from work and I was thinking about forgiveness. And that came to mind because of uh, a certain reason. And of course, we preached on it and taught on it before here on social media. But the statement is like a light bulb went off in my head or in my spirit. And I believe it was the Lord actually sharing something with me. And I'm sharing it with you today because as stated, I know how the Lord talks and deals with me. But one of the statements that we made and I noticed is made throughout religion or throughout the Christian faith, or at least the fellowship of churches that I used to be involved with and still currently am. But the statement was made, I can forgive you. But I don't have not, I don't have to have anything to do with you. And when I was driving home and thinking about that, but I said, that's not really true forgiveness, the thought came actually. And as I began to meditate on it and think about it, I became quite concerned with that thought processes or that statement or that verbiage is that I can forgive you, but I don't have to have anything else to do with you. And it's the more I meditate on it, the more I realize how erroneous that is and how far away from the will of God that statement really takes us. It's another trick of the adversary and of the devil to think that once we have forgiven someone, that fellowship is continuously broken with that person or persons, that we never come to a place where we can lay aside our differences, where we can even compromise or even pray together and think about it, and therefore come back together successfully. So now what we have done in essence, especially if this mentality occurs amongst the Christian believers, we have so successfully divided the body of Christ and his members one from another. Therefore, the body of Christ is disjointed. We're out of joint. We're out of connection. We're out of unity. And therefore, as we always stated, the devil has a major advantage over us. And we must change our mentality. We must change some of our dogmas or doctrinal doctrines or doctrinal truths that we profess to be doctrinal truths when in essence they are in defiance of God's word. And the thing is, I've heard this taught 
for multiple years. And I've heard this stated by various Christians through various reasons and various things. And even I myself am guilty of that. And it's time that we lay rest this heresy amongst us. And that is in the church. Because God's whole purpose is for the body of Christ to remain unified as much as possible. There are already so many different things and challenges and things that we teach and things that we believe in and of course denominationalism and those that have separated us through even their made up doctrines and teachings that divides us so immensely. And some of us are so passionate about some of those things that we've learned that we don't realize that it's time that we re-examine those things and put them to rest and be done away with it. The thing is, we have to learn the ways of God, not based upon our conceptions or preceptions or our intellectual abilities or the things that we have been taught by our parents or by those that stood before us for many of years. And now we are being challenged once again to explore what God's intent really was when it comes to reconciliation and when it comes to basic truths, the principles, the rudimentary truths that we have learned and those things that we have allowed others to speak into our spirit man that we held on to as truths when truth of the matter is if it were a life ring or a life vest, we would have sunk. But now let's find a way to regain our buoyancy in God through his word and the truthfulness of his word and the truthfulness of his intentions towards us so that we can walk together in the trueness of the faith that he intended for us and never once be led astray by something that was taught in error because error will always divide us when God's truth serves to unify us by the spirit of the living Lord. So now let us go into the word of the Lord. We're going to start at Hebrews, the second chapter and the first verse. One of the scripture that reminds us of God's reconciliation with man is Genesis 9 and 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Let us now go back into the word of the Lord with Pastor Whitfield. Hebrews, the second chapter and the first verse reads as follows. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. Going back to what I said earlier, is that we must pay earnest heed, listen to me, not to someone's opinion, not to someone's intellectual understanding, because we can miss it. But what the Holy Spirit is saying unto the church through the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And it goes on, therefore we ought to give a more earnest, more diligence give our full attention and full devotion to the earnest heed to the things which we have heard of the Holy Spirit and what's being taught by the Holy Spirit. Lest at any times we should let them slip away from us or fall away from us, which is what some people have done with this teaching about reconciliation. But Hebrews, the second chapter, and the 17th verse, read for, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. If you really understand what this man said here, it's wherefore in all things it behooved him, it was, it's in his best interest. To be made like unto us, it's in his best interest as well as in our best interest that Christ was made to be just like us in the image of men and sinful flesh. He had to take away or put down his deity 
and put away his spiritualness to come to earth, to be born of a virgin, to be birthed into a human body, into a human existence, and go through every single temptation and every sin, be tempted on all points just as we are, but yet remain without sin so that he can identify with each and every one of us. Although God created us, when it comes to the human experience, God, he does but doesn't understand. He understands all things, but he cannot sin. So he does not know what it's like to be tempted by sin. He cannot look on sin. But Jesus Christ came down here to take on our sins on his own body. And he who knew no sin became sin that he might be a faithful high priest, that he might be able to identify with each and every single thing that we are tempted with. Now, don't think that he was not tempted at all points as we are. You may not have been, been tempted with all things, but the Bible says that he was tempted at every single point. He was tempted with every single sin. With every single wrong, with every single ill, the devil tempted him with it that he himself might have the experience of what it's like for man to be drawn away from God by sin and sin's desires and its temptation. And he could feel how strong these attacks are spiritually when it comes to temptation. So that now he as a faithful high priest who is now ascended back into the heavens, can now identify and make proper intercessions and, and even defend you when it comes to your sins and temptation and stand before God in the courtroom of judgment when Lucifer himself is damning you to hell because of what you have done. But Jesus is saying there that, yes, Father, they may have sinned, but my blood covers them because they have asked for forgiveness. And because if you really understand reconciliation, the DNA of Christ's molecular structure is t it tends towards reconciliation without a question of those who ask of him. It is in his DNA, he is genetically disposed to forgiving people and reconciling people and bringing folks back unto the Father in full-fledged relationship as though the offenses have never happened. And because of this, his entire purpose was, is, and will be to reconcile everyone that has fallen away from God back to the Father by the blood, by His blood, by the blood of Jesus Christ, through the sacrifices, through us asking for forgiveness and repentance, never to return there. But reconciliation, if you really understand it, if you really fully understand it, now giving some definitions here, reconciliation means an act of reconciling or the state of being reconciled. It is the process of making consistent or compatible. It is making you consistent with the nature of God. And it's also making you compatible with God. If you, some of you have heard of the uh, test that they have out there on eHarmony, e where they test you in every area of your life to properly align you with someone that would be as close or is a perfect match towards you so that you would have all things in common enough that the relationship would thrive and would come to a level of success and limit the chances of failure. And the same way this is what God, Jesus is doing. He is making you compatible and consistent through the spirit of reconciliation, to be one with your Father who is God. So that everything that is in you now is compatible when the blood of Jesus Christ is extended 
into your life that same molecular DNA structure that is in his veins, that flow through his veins, that heavenly kingly blood is now extended to your life. And because of it, when you ingest the Holy Communion, you have now received by faith the transfusion of blood that you need to walk a life in dedication the way God wants you to do. The problem is, is that when you have a problem with walking with God and falling to sin, it's because you've had a kidney failure in the spirit. And now you need dialysis so that God can cleanse your blood through, not chemicals, but through the blood of Jesus Christ, cleansing your blood from the sinful nature so that you can now walk back in full communion with God in divine relationship based upon the workings of reconciliation. Now let us go into, again, the word, the reconcile. It also means to make oneself or another no longer opposed to one another. One of the things that you could do in forgiveness is forgive a person of acts or act in act. But you can forgive them, but you can still yet be in opposition against one another. And because of this, Forgiveness cannot just work alone. Forgiveness must work with reconciliation. You must be willing to repair the relationship, discuss your differences, put aside your differences, and so to speak, to bury the hatchet and to move away with it, never to acquire it again. When a person walks in reconciliation, you can reconcile yourself to the or not reconcile yourself to the point that your spirit man becomes spiritually insufficient or deficient and impoverished because you're not experiencing all that God wants you to experience. There was a quote that I had read earlier this or earlier this morning as I was finalizing in my preparations to preach this message. And there is a person, a historical figure, who's still yet alive in Africa, Nelson Mandela, who once made this statement. Having resentment against someone is like drinking poison and thinking it will kill your enemies. In other words, it's you drinking the poison, but the hopes is that while you're ingesting the poison of discontentment, is that you're hoping that that poison will kill your enemies. But in essence, it doesn't take much intellectual ability to understand that if you ingest poison, then you're the victim, not the ones that you've intended to be the victims. So resentment, when we fail to reconcile and when we forgive, only to forgive, but yet do not make reparations or repairing of that relationship, we have just ingested a partial poison or partial, we've taken part of a partial truth but not employing the fullness of God's intent or his desire. So again, reconciling means to become friendly with someone after an estrangement or to reestablish friendly relationships between two or more people. The reestablishment of a friendly relationship, not with hostility still remaining. Reconciliation means that all hostility have successfully been ceased and, and desist, and now we're moving along the paths of peacefulness, friendliness, the repair of the breaches in the wall that now Lucifer, the devil, has no inroads. He cannot sneak in through the cracks in the mortar. He cannot sneak in through the cracks in the brick or the stone. But we who are the priesthood of God, as First Peter says, we are being built together into a holy temple, tab tabernacle, or habitation. We want our cohesiveness in God to be so firm that even if we had a falling out with our brother and sister that was of a major, major thing, we can repair that the devil cannot use this against us by any means What? So ever.
Praise the Lord, everyone. This is Pastor Whitfield reminding you to join us twice a week on social media for our weekly broadcast on Sundays and on Wednesday for our Wednesday night time in the Word segment. Join us and be empowered by the Word of the Lord unto you. Reconciling also means to settle a quarrel or differences. Someone that you were in warfare verbally with, maybe even physically with. Even the thoughts have even generated in your heart or mind to become homicidal and even suicidal. Or to take someone's possessions or things or look to rebel or even seek out revenge against them. It means that you lay aside those thought processes of negativity and that you move on to the path of positivity of what can God do if I trust him, if I believe in him, if I present this to him in prayer, what he can he do to repair this relationship so that we will no longer experience this, that he himself would remove the bitterness and the anxiety of it from our hearts forever. And to make two apparently conflicting things compatible or consistent with each other, to reconsecrate those things that have been desecrated, we must realize that we must make once again holy that which was, which was made unholy, but that which God intended to be holy, and our relationships and our walks and our friendships in God are holy, and we can make it an unholy thing. How do you think the world views the church people when we are brawling and fighting one another? We have just marred Christ's names name and his ability and we have diminished the power and the authority and even we have caused some to even lose the potential of wanting to have a relationship with him where they see the hypocrisy that is in the church because we won't work through our differences we won't reconcile we won't put our brothers and sisters in the proper light, but yet we spew the negativity and the poison about them, not realizing that it hinders and it actually destroys our testimony in the world amongst the unsaved and the unsanctified. What a major travesty. What a horrific thing that that is. When we who profess to be of the body of Christ, now we see the damage and the devastation that has been wrought because we are so childish and immature in how we handle one another as well as how we handle the truths of God. But yet we profess to be holy, we profess to be wise, we profess to be saved. We profess to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We profess to be the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. We profess that he's our Lord and our Savior. We profess our trust in him. We profess that we have laid down our lives for him. We have professed that we are dead to the flesh, no longer to live therein. We profess that we walk in love and in unity. And all the while we see all this discord. In the midst of us, where is the truthfulness of God? The Bible says, let every man be a liar and let God be true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let us, as the body of believers, repent of our failure and our unwillingness to reconcile with those to whom God has placed in the body of believers, especially those that are without. We at all costs and at all points must guard our testimonies and we must guard the sanctity that comes through the Spirit of the Holy Ghost 
to unify the body of believers and dispelling the myths that there's a lot of falsehood and hypocrisy that exists amongst us. It's time that the true worshipers and the true warriors and the truly anointed of God arise and say that we must expel this heresy from our midst and from the body of Christian believers. And that we once again must be unified and unified in the way that we honor and walk in the Spirit of God. But we must walk it in unity. So again, the word means to bring together again. From a word which means reconcile or to make friendly or cope or conciliate. In other words, it means to walk in accord, in agreement, that we must find ways to compromise, not our standards of holiness and righteousness, but when we're wrong, that we find a way to compromise. And one of the things, one of the lessons that I've, the courses that I've taken, it's about crucial conversation. Understanding why one person feel the way that they feel when they've said something and also to understand the perception of the other person of how you said something that they had perceived and they may not have perceived the meaning that you were intending because of the inflections or the tone in your voice, your body posture, or even your facial expressions. But therefore, we must sit down. The Bible says, even of God, though your sins be as scarlet, let us sit down and let us reason together. You must be willing, regardless of how offended a person may be, is to turn, turn off your emotional ears so that you can listen with the ears of understanding so that you can dispel anything that has brought anything negative between the two of you. So that you can work on a compromise of repairing the relationship. And it means that sometimes you must bend on a stance that you have. Or you must forsake a stance that you have. Or a belief that was unfounded. So that you can repair a meaningful, functioning relationship between you and the estranged party. It also means... <clears throat> An establishment or reestablishment of a harmonious relationship. That you're removing the reproachfulness or reproachment reached between war and factions and that you once again regain unity. Reconciliation is more than the act of forgiveness, which I stated earlier, because we can forgive folks but never reconcile with them. And if you take nothing else away from this lesson, I want you to hold on to that statement. When the heart of reconciliation is not only to forgive, but to repair relationships, it is, it is its former glory. But the glory of reconciliation is that it has been repaired perpetually. It is reuni it's a reuni reuniting of hearts for one common purpose. And that purpose is to glorify God. Jesus said this said it this way in John 13 34 to 35 a new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another as I have loved you that ye also love one another and by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if you have loved one towards another and I can boldly sit here and state that we don't fully see the true spirit of love in the body of, church, of Christ. How many times have you walked into an assembly of believers and you saw cliques? How many times have you walked into the body of believers and were, was not embraced or said, brother or sister, I love you? If you get love nowhere else, you should get love from God and in the household of faith. Someone should show you love, especially if you're walking in there and not a believer. Because by this shall all men know that we are his disciples for the love that we have one towards another. Think about it. That's food for thought. As a matter of fact, it is such food for thought. Let me read that verse, verses again. 
John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment, a new order. I'm giving to you the body of believers, a command that must be obeyed. He's not saying you have a choice. You must obey this command that I'm giving to you. And being a military man, you know that if you don't follow an order, it is considered dereliction of duty, punishable by the laws that govern that society. And God is saying here the same way, you must obey this law because if you don't, there are ramifications that you must suffer as a result. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. In other words, think about it. How often has God forgiven us of sins? Gross sins. But yet, he forgives us time and time again without measure. And every single time that he does, he is faithful to reconcile that relationship between us. How many times have a brother or sister has offended you? One, twice, three, and you failed to give reconciliation? Uh, how dare us? Walk in defiance of God's word. All of us inclusive. I've stated to you I've done so many times. But God dealt with me just as much as this word is dealing with all of us. That we must make reparations and repair of the relationship. That you love one another as I have loved you. And he loved us so much that he became extremely sacrificial. That he was willing to be crucified on Calvary's cross. No greater love has any man than this. But that a man lays down his life for his friend. That's true love. That ye also love one another. And he says by this definitively. By this shall. Not maybe not might but shall. All men know that ye are my disciples. That love identifies us with being his followers who have been taught by him to walk, teach, taught. We have been the students of his love. We have witnessed his love. We have been partakers of his love. But now we must show the same measure of love towards our fellow brethren. And the people in the world that he has shown and expressed towards us. He said, if you have loved one towards another, that all men will know that we are his disciples. Ephesians 2 and 16 says this. And that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. When you walk and when we walk, and I walk in divine love, we kill the enemy. We kill his power. We kill his abilities. We assassinate his demons and demonic forces. And we heap love upon those who despitefully use us and those who despitefully and honorably come up against us. By heaping love on them and by loving them, we heap coals of fire upon their heads, the Bible says. In other words, you bring upon them the eternal judgment when they fail to understand that you love them despite their actions. But this hot or heatedness is not to get them to spend an eternity in hell. But this heatedness or coals that is being heaped upon their heads is to put some intensity under them. That they also will want to change and come into a relationship whereby they're walking now successfully with God and the Holy Spirit. So we must understand that God himself wants us to live according to standards. And the standard 
is love. If your ministry or church is interested in scheduling Pastor Whitfield to come preach for you, he can be reached at FHLMRS12 at gmail.com. We would love to be a part of your next function. The Bible even goes on to say this in Matthew the 5th chapter and the 24th verse. Leave if, if a brother or sister has offended you or you're out of relationship with them. It says these words. And these words are significantly key. Matthew 5 and 24. Leave there thy gift before the altar. And go thy way first and be reconciled to thy brother. And then come and offer thy gifts. Listen, he's talking about in the, in the temple times. But let's talk about the church age. Our tithes, our offerings, our gifts of worship, our ministries, our singing, our ushering, us being a deacon or trustee. A pastor, elder, minister, bishop, apostle, whatever your title or made up title may be that you've assigned to yourself, reverend doctor, doctor reverend, whomever. But here, how many times have you been in offense or separated and divided against your brother or your sister, but yet you still brought your gift and your offering and your tithes and your talents and your ability and your ministry before the Lord? But knowing that your gift was not being acceptable. Listen, I was on a fast many, many years ago, more than about 20 years ago. And I had did something, and the person, we had actually did things towards each other. But yet, it was my week to minister to church, to preach. And I was fasting. And you know, the second day into the fast, but God told me to break the fast. I'm not honoring your sacrifice because you have not repaired the relationship between you and this individual. And the scriptures say, is this not a fast that I have chosen to break the bonds of wickedness? So that we might also come together and be unified again, to paraphrase it. But the thing is this, we must be repairs of the relationship. Which means, if we really look at the church world today where it is, I would even be bold enough to say and surmise this. Is that if we really looked at the way our relationships are, there should be multiple gifts in front of the altar of God that have been left there for people that have left it to pursue reconciliation with their brothers or sisters. And once they have been reconciled, they can come and present their gifts to God, which means that now God will accept the gift as being honorable and with a true spirit. But one of the things that get me is the gross pride that exists in the household of God. We think by saying that I'm, I'm asking you to forgive me and let's repair, it means that an advantage, an opportunity, or something that's being taken away from us. Yes, it is. In Christian death, when we die to ourselves, we're giving up the ability to defend ourselves. We're giving up the ability to say that, yes, I may have been offended, but I give up all of my rights to it so that I can be one and identify with the sufferings of Christ Jesus. We only identify with Christ when we suffer with him. 
And when you go back and ask someone to forgive you and you reconcile the relationship successfully, you have just died all the more to, to the flesh and have become all the more like Christ. And it may be you may have to be the bigger person. Whereas the other person may not see the need, but God deals with some of us, listen, in our sleep, in our dreams, in our thought processes, while we're sitting on the job, when we're sitting in a place of something that we enjoy, we can't enjoy it fully. God's hand is dealing with you. His hand is dealing with us. He's dealing with our hearts that we might move in to reconciliation. Romans 5 and 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Listen, going back to what I just stated, by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Listen, when you can reconcile, especially with a brother or sister, you have made that relationship in God's eyesight and with him much more concrete. And even when those without can see the disunity has now been repaired, how much of a greater testimony will that be when they could see you fellowshipping and there is no animosity and it can be discerned and easily seen that this is a pure love relationship. Between brothers and brothers in Christ, not talking about the opposite. I'm talking about when we can walk together as brothers and sisters, according to the word of God, in the unity of God, and all people can see that. What a great and powerful testimony that is when you never have to open up your mouth and say a word, but you are the written epistle of God being read by all men, the Bible says. Ephesians 2 and 1 says this, And ye have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among, among whom also we had our conversations in time past, in the lust of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God, listen, but God. Thank God for buts or conjunctions. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with Christ by grace Ye are saved and have raised us up together and made us to sit together. Listen, this is what reconciliation really does. And made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Don't you know when you are fully reconciled to God and fully reconciled to your brothers and sisters, God grants you a seat in the heavenlies to sit amongst his spirit to sit amongst the angels, to sit amongst his son and the Holy Spirit, and to hear things that are unspeakable in human nature or human flesh, things that are totally divine in nature. And he grants you to hear things that are unlawful for natural, carnal-minded people to hear. There are privileges attached. To be reconciled to God. When he sits you in a place of authority and divine visitation in his presence. And made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ. He wants to show you a kindness that we have never experienced before in this life or in this world. 
For by grace are you saved through faith. It is faith. When you reconcile, it is through faith. When you forgive, it is through faith. Through faith, and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, not of anything that you've done, not of any service that you have rendered. Not because of how you preach and that you're a great orator and you never have any missteps with your wording and your pronunciation or enunciation. But everything that is, comes across out of your lips and out of your mouth is clear and divine revelation flow. But he said it's not a works lest any man should boast. You have no reason or no cause to boast about what God is doing through you. But you boast in the power and the authority that rests in God's and his enabling of your yielded soul and vessel to flow through. When you become boastful and prideful, you are no longer, longer yielded, but you're functioning off of your talent and your gifts and gifts and callings are without repentance. God wants you to yield your gift and your callings and your talents to him that he might function through you and it may be pure in its nature. Listen, not a works lest any man should boast for we are the work, we are, we are his worksmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Listen, 2 Corinthians, the 5th verse, starting at the 18th verse to the 20th. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Everything we do, everything we say in ministry or in life comes from God if we walk in the truthfulness of it. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given unto us, listen, the ministry of reconciliation. How can we say that we are the ministers of reconciliation when we don't put into practice reconciling our own relationships how can we say that we are truly the ministers of forgiveness when we don't forgive how can we say that we are the ministers of God's love when we don't show love if we're going to be the ministers of righteousness and the ministers of love and the ministers of a new covenant and the ministers of life and the ministers of Jesus Christ, then we must be willing to take on the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, verse 19, to wit, that God was in Christ, listen, reconciling the world unto himself. God was bringing us back into peaceful relationship with him that would not warrant eternal separation and destruction. Or suffering, but in the present age that we might be called the friends and the sons of God. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation, which I'm proclaiming to you today. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. God has ordained you as an ambassador to go in, into hostile foreign lands. And not necessarily geographically, but spiritually. And being there as an ambassador to serve the purpose of speaking peacefulness of the kingdom. And when persons wish to defect out of sin, you being the ambassador or the representative of the state or the kingdom of God, that once they step into your space, they have stepped out of the world of judgment, out of the world of sin, out of the world of degradation, and have stepped in to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You as an ambassador are there to embrace them 
and give them spiritual asylum and true citizenship in the kingdom of God for all eternity. Have you struggled with reconciling with a brother or sister or perhaps a group of people? The Lord is only a prayer away from helping you. He understands how difficult this can be. But with the help of the Lord, you're able to conquer and be victorious. Let us now go into the word of the Lord with Pastor William Whitfield. You are the ambassador of Jesus Christ. You are the ambassadors of God. And God wants you to be successful in your appointment as an ambassador of his kingdom. To the kingdoms of this world. So we can say once and forever, Behold, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God. And that's what we want to hear in the end. That all languages, all tongues, and every nation has taken and eaten of the fruits of reconciliation. Colossians 1 and 20. And having made peace through the blood of, Je uh, blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth, or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled unto himself. This is a blessed thing to walk in and be a part of. And this is why the purpose of reconciliation is so important. Listen, Jesus told even the Pharisees and the scribes this. That Moses permitted you to write a letter of divorcement to your wives because of the hardness of your hearts. Because you were not willing to bend from your position to take on another position that would have dynamically changed that situation forever. And it would have kept things that should have been held together in cohesiveness together. Listen, friends. This is a message not only to you, but even as I'm speaking, this word is even ministering to my spirit as well. And I want you to understand how much God truly loves His creation. That Jesus Christ came on a cross, came to earth, and he died on Calvary's cross and on the third day rose again. That you might receive this reconciliatory ministry. That you might walk in a repaired relationship. Something about things that have been repaired is that you could see the cracks. And you could see the stress and what cause and where. The relationships were separated. But when you walk in the trueness of God's reconciliation. The stress marks and the breaks and the fractures. Don't even exist anymore. It is as though God has divinely caused them to disappear. And that even if you were to remember. It would not be a remembrance of a source of contention. But it will be a source of rejoicing because you have seen what God himself has done for you. And for those that he has entrusted the word of the Lord with. I want you friends, if you are so ready to reconcile your relationships. It's that you begin to pray and see God on the timing. Remember, Jacob. Even when he was about to go into a certain place, he was fearful because he knew his brother was about to approach him. But God put him into a dream. And that dream, the next morning, his brother went out, he went out to meet his brother. And all things had been forgiven because God had blessed them the same equally. You never know unless you take the chance 
how God has blessed you immensely and how he has blessed your brethren immensely. For those of you that aren't saved, you don't know how immensely God is willing to bless you if you would just give your life to Jesus Christ without hesitation, without reluctance, without holding anything in reserve. Trust him. Try him. Put him to the test and see will not he turn and bless you. He will. You have this word of reconciliation that he will sit you in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Today, if you need prayer, I pray that you write us at FHLMRS12 at gmail.com. If you're watching this broadcast, please subscribe to the channel, which is Pastor William Whitfield, so that you can be kept abreast of when we post messages on social media. Tell your friends, your families, your neighbors, people that are sick and shut in, people that are part of other churches. We're not trying to check church members, but there are some times during the week that you need a word from the Lord. You can access these recordings 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. Even if you would like for me to come to your church and preach, I can be reached at FHLMRS12 at gmail.com and I'll provide and we'll provide you our contact information. We would love to fellowship with pastors out there. We would love to hear from pastors, even from those of you that are watching. Share this message with your pastors. We want to develop relationships. We're not seeking a penny, a nickel, or a dime. We're, we're accepting and looking for godly, divine relationships in the Lord. God bless you all. I pray that you join me again on this coming Wednesday for our Wednesday night time in the Word. And on next Sunday for another dynamic word from the Lord. This is Pastor Whitfield saying, I love you in the Holy Ghost. Now go out and repair those breaches in the wall. Until next week, God bless you all in Jesus' name. As always, thank you for tuning in to today's message. Join us again on this coming Wednesday as well as next Sunday for our time in the Word together. If you're interested, please subscribe to this channel at Pastor William Whitfield on YouTube or other social media sites. Share it with your friends, your family, your loved ones, and your neighbors. Until next week, this is Pastor Whitfield saying thank you and God bless you in the Lord.